Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. I found this kind of interesting. The major winter storm that hit um, the central part of the United States uh, last week at the end of the week spreading the very heavy snow from Kansas through Missouri, Illinois, and eventually here into parts of lower Michigan and on into the northeast. Well, that storm system continued to push its way across the open Atlantic. I'd like to show you where it is here in just a few moments. But first, the warmer conditions that came in behind this. Watch the snow swath right in through here as viewed on satellite. Now, this was back Back in the 18th, the day after that system, by the 19th we already saw it shrinking a little bit and then by the 20th it was nearly gone. And today, just taking a look at some of the latest satellite imagery, let's just kind of peel this back to today, you can see that most of that snow right in through that area has completely melted on the much warmer conditions that have come through. But you can also see how cloudy much of the United States was today. And we're going to come back to the storm system that's moving through the country in just a few moments. First thing, though, I would like to show you is where that storm system ended up. And so this is where it currently sits, way up here just near Iceland at very deep low. And it's produced incredibly strong winds across the open North Atlantic, and they've come in and hit Ireland pretty hard. So earlier today, when I was just kind of keeping an eye on global weather patterns, I did see a very interesting tweet about uh, one of the implications of this. And this was apparently happening in Ireland. This was a, a big push of... Well, it's almost like storm surge here, pushing up this 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 river, this creek, uh, in and around uh, this this particular coastal region of Ireland. Just amazing to see the surge coming in here on the water. And again, I, you know, I'm just pulling this off of, of something I saw on Twitter, but I found it to be a fascinating kind of weather event. Now, just thinking about all of that, I want to come back to this. How well have we done at the forecasting here so far at the beginning of this year? Now, you know that I do rely pretty heavily on model guidance, and there's a reason for that. Sometimes pulling out the individual signals from the teleconnections and kind of over using them to override the model forecast can be quite tricky. And plus, when a model has built up some trust in its forecast with me, I, I tend to want to rely on it. So I'm going to show you why I've been doing that. This was the forecast released at the very beginning of, of January for the following 45 days, which takes us out here to the 21st of February. We're looking again at a forecast release on the 6th of January up until today. And what I'm looking at here is this. The models were very dry in California. We, we knew that was going to be a solid forecast because of the lack of a subtropical component of the jet stream. The models were picking up on ridging happening here, but bringing the flow in and across the Pacific Northwest like this. We expected some convergent flow here, but better snow here along the Rockies, but drier conditions uh, throughout the plains into the Western Corn Belt. We then had seen that this area was going to be quite active into New England. So I look at all of that and I just step back and say, well, how well did the models do? And overall, if we were going to give them a grade, I'd have to say it'd be a, a pretty decent grade. I mean, the models were very dry in California. Some places you're having the driest start to a new year on record. Uh, they picked up on the dryness that was going to stretch from the southern plains here into the central and northern plains and extending through from the western Corn Belt into the upper Midwest. This was picked up on very well, as was the heavier snows that we were seeing at times here uh, along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. So you see that, and, and it really um, kind of just instills some confidence in the models. And the reason why I bring this up is because I'm about to use them once again to kind of give us a look at if there is a possibility of seeing this pattern shift around to start to be corrective on some of these longer term drought issues. And we're going to talk about that right now. Because we still see that our La Nina is in the background state of the atmosphere. So you see here the colder water that's in place. We have seen as of late water that has gotten colder right in through here. We call this the Pacific Meridional Mode region. This up here would be a part of what we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We've talked a lot about those features in recent video updates. But what's interesting right now that I'm finding is that um, the trade winds have really gone and, and made another big surge. Now, this is really what the trade winds look like back in December, right? We saw the leading edge of the blue colors really pushing strongly in this direction. You see that over the next 15 days, that's going to continue. That's going to give us a lot of rising motion right here in, in the um, MJO regions of 4, 5, and 6. And you say, well, why is that? Well, these warmer colors represent where there's either slower trade winds or even westerly motion. And so where they come together, that's where you're going to get the air to rise. You know, seeing these strong trade winds look something like this. There they are, okay, right there just north of the equator and along the equator would 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 make you think that this La Nina is, is redeveloping. But I want to assure you that it is not. This is the way that La Ninas fade. Uh, as they fade, I kind of 
say this jokingly, but they kind of kick and scream on their way out. This La Nina is continuing to fade this late winter into spring, but right now we're seeing a resurgence of very Nina-like behavior. And what I mean by that is the Southern Oscillation Index is back up around 10 or 11, and we're going to see the implications of that in the forecast moving forward here. Now, where this got us from the beginning of the year until now, especially across the West Coast, was a big breaking ridge that came in like this. And we had winds that were anomalously out of the east, basically in the wrong direction to return good moisture here, coming off the subtropical jet. That's very common with La Nina. The pattern then dove into deeper troughs here before running out into a blocking ridge pattern over the open North Atlantic Ocean. I still feel as though the tropical teleconnections are the most dominant. And that means that as we go forward into March, um, we'll have to just continue to observe the very weak flow we have in the jet stream in this area. That I think is critical uh, to the upcoming pattern. What's so important about it is what it means in overall for the drought picture. So through February 17th, this was the update that came out last week, we still have about 70-71% of the country in some stage of drought. And this has been a, a major discussion point as of late because you know the last time we saw this much of the country in drought like this was back in uh, August of 2012. Much different scenario. Of course, that was drought that developed and really strengthened over summer. We're talking about drought that's in place already in winter. But the question is, is this going to be around? Is this going to continue to be a major point or will spring rains undo that? So that's what we want to do. We, we want to address what's happening in March, maybe a little bit of a glimpse into April uh, to see how things are going to unfold. Now, we did recently bring some snow to some places we desperately needed. I'm talking about Montana, getting into right here along the, the border of North and South Dakota, getting into the upper Midwest. And of course, we brought in some more snow to the Cascades. And why I say this is an area that needs it is because if you look, Going back, I pulled this off on Friday, but if you look right in through here, this is that area uh, that kind of extends into the, the western Corn Belt uh, and here into the, uh, the northern plains that has really missed out on a lot of snowfall this year. So we just brought some snow into this area, which is helping that region out. Will we get moisture back into Nebraska? That's an area I'm concerned about because if you just go back here and look at the, the uh, change maps, we've seen that over the last, let's just look back over the last month, that region in Nebraska, Western Iowa, this has been an area where drought has expanded, and I'm very concerned about that. Now, if we look at what the um, Climate Prediction Center released last week, we can see that there is concern of a drought developing there throughout the month of February, and it's very consistent with what we've seen. And then the seasonal drought outlook shows a couple of things. The drought really staying here, mostly to the west of the 95th meridian, uh, maybe the 100th meridian, and, and extending all the way back to California, with some drought persisting here in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, parts of, of Iowa. And our big question is going to be, is this drought going to continue to get worse as we go forward? So let's let's talk about that. We had uh, an update released late last week from uh, NOAA. And NOAA's outlook uh, keeps very warm conditions overall in the south, but brings in repeated shots at some cold air across the north. That I, I, I'm certainly consistent with La Nina here. This is also very consistent with La Nina, much above average in the Ohio River Valley and above average in the Pacific Northwest with drier concerns to the south. But I want to show you something that's happening right now that um, is going to offer a little bit of a, um, a different view on this. And that event is the fact that, as we've been discussing, the MJO has come out in the Indian Ocean. And its forecast has sweep through phases four, five, and maybe in the next 15 plus days end up somewhere in phase six. Now, why I say that is because historically, the MJO doesn't spend much time in phases four and five when there is a La Nina this time of year. That's not a very common phase for it to be in. So therefore, we don't have a, just an overwhelming amount of statistical evidence to support this. But if it is going to go over here, and again, phases four and five, that's just north of Australia. If it's going to do that, history would guide us towards saying that the flow pattern will get rid of the big blocking ridges that have been over the west. Now, it does not mean you're going to get a big subtropical component of the jet stream. That's not in this forecast. But removing the very large ridges over the west would be consistent if the MJO does move over to phases four, five, six, any of those phases. This also would indicate, so better moisture in the northwest. This would also indicate an active storm track in through here because we're going to have to get that flow to get up over this ridging that we'd see just off the coast. Now, I know that I've been talking a lot about that MJO trying to do something to move this ridge 
West, and it has been uh, persistently wrong in the forecast. But we continue to look at that to see if there's any sort of a lag in the forecast. In other words, oh, okay, the MJO goes there now, but does it take a couple of weeks for the momentum to transfer out of the tropics to make that occur? So I'm going to try to answer that by looking at two different models here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the ECMWF weeklies, brand new, just released uh, this afternoon. In fact, let's get uh, the update on this. Sorry. There we go. This is the brand new weeklies. Okay, as we play this forward, now this is the current week. Let's get out into that first full week of March. Now at that point, the jet stream still builds up into a ridge like this and it comes cascading down through here. So there's a lot of convergent flow and that's why we see drier conditions. This could produce better snows for Montana though, because that would push up against the mountains and they need that snow. Now moving into the second week of March, take a look at this. You said we've backed off on the much below average precipitation here for the west. And even as we move into the third week of March, now you notice this, the models as we get out here toward the equinox have actually moved over to wetter than average anomalies for the Northwest. Now I know you're looking at that going, that's not a strong signal. And I say, I know that's not a strong signal, but it is not a signal for overly dry conditions. And that's what's very important about this. Because if you look at this in a 30 day window, let me now take you all the way out through the month of March. We have better precipitation coming in here into the mountains in the west. Continues to be quite wet here, but the models go very aggressive on drier conditions throughout almost the whole of the cotton belt. And that might be overdone in a big way. Because as we plow on into the beginning of April, okay, we continue to see better and better chances in the models of wetter conditions here in the west. And one of the reasons for that is the models are responding to the fluctuations in La Nina, the movement of the MJO, how that affects the North Pacific jet stream and possibly pushing the drier conditions west under a bigger ridge. This is, again, a thing that I need to wait and see if it's actually going to occur, but that's at least the latest guidance I have at this point. Now, I said we do some multi-model analysis. I would like to take you out again to that second week of March. What you see here from the CFSV2 is you know, overall, no major dry signals in the West, active through the Midwest. You also see down here that the model is aggressive on being drier throughout the cotton belt. Notice that. Then as you plow here on forward into week three, all right, we see better moisture for the Northwest, still active over here in the Ohio River Valley over toward the Mid-Atlantic, but drier in this region. So I think that's quite consistent between the two models, at least looking out here uh, to the equinox. So. I still think the dominant players are coming out of the tropics, and that's why I continue to put my focus on that as we move forward here. But this is at least what I've got for you so far as we look forward to this next, you know, 30 to 45 days. Now, we got to come back to what's going on right now, and what's going on right now is that we saw all morning this morning heavier snows moving through this part of the northern tier of the United States. These snows came out of Montana, where we did pick up in some places right in here in southern Montana. Uh, several inches of snow uh, yesterday and, and last night, bringing in better moisture to the Pacific Northwest. But on this radar animation, you start to see right here at the very end some storms popping up in this part of Texas. It rained over here in the lower Mississippi River Valley for most of the morning. But it's those storms right in through here that I'm going to watch. You're seeing some live lightning strikes late in the afternoon here on Monday. And these are the storms we're going to watch later on this evening to try to push right into this area. And the reason why I'm watching them is because when we look at our all hazards weather map, very, very busy today. We've got winter storm warnings, including a blizzard warning right here in this part of almost the tip of the Red River Valley. Winter weather advisories, flood watches that extend again through parts of the Mid-South into, into New England. Red flag warnings on the back side of this. And throughout the West where that deeper trough lives, that's where we've got um, just everything from freeze watches to winter storm watches, winter storm. It's just a very active pattern. But I want to start off to the south first because you see right in through here this evening, that will be the corridor over which we're expecting to see our strong to severe storms. And as this first of two big winter storms takes off, we're going to keep an eye here tomorrow on Tuesday for the risk of severe storms. And again, that's over parts of the Mid-South. All right, so you saw how busy that all has its weather map is. Let's start to distill this down by doing a multi-model analysis. Okay, this is right about where we are now. So these are the storms popping up here. Look at how strong these winds are to the north at a tight pressure gradient. And those storms, just keep an eye right here first, are going to start to push through the Red River Valley right there along this area. That's our risk area this evening. In the overnight hours to the north of this, we're going to undercut 
some very warm air aloft and give the risk of ice accumulation through here while we still have snow and very strong winds on the backside, hence the blizzard warning for this area. See how tight that pressure gradient is? Snow continues to slide down the front range of the Rocky Mountains, and the first system moves forward, spreading heavy rain in this area, hence the flood watches, and ice risk north of that Tuesday morning here. And look at the snow, heavy snow and very strong winds on the backside. I'll get you those snowfall totals in a moment. So that system pulls into New England by Tuesday evening. Again, spreading a lot of heavy rain. The ice will be in Ontario and Quebec, snow wrapped around the backside of this. And while that system pulls through New England, leaving a lingering front here, the second system has more cold air to work with. See this high? It's pushed very far to the south. And so the upper level low spinning over the southwest comes in to that scenario with all of that cold air. And that's where we're gonna to have to have a, a big discussion about the ice threat in through here. Now from this point, I'm gonna switch over to just the European today. And the reason why is that uh, lately, as we've talked about, the GFS's performance has been a bit spotty. Been doing much better as of late, but the European's been better on the timing. So I just wanna kind of give that one perspective today. So 12Z European is fully in, and I'm gonna show you where we are. This evening, remember, we are watching the storms in through this area, the potential for some ice in southern Wisconsin, but the snow and the strong winds on the backside. So we've seen the model play this scenario out through Tuesday night, getting into Wednesday morning, and now let's get into about Wednesday, here we go, 6 p.m. At this point, the second of these two waves is coming through. So there's the snow in the four corner states after coming through California. And now we start to see the influence of that really cold Arctic air that's gonna go underneath the warm, moist air that's aloft about a mile above our heads right here. So the pinks represent ice. So you see that on 6 p.m. Wednesday night into Thursday morning, Thursday midday, Thursday evening, there's gonna be a quarter in through here that I'm gonna be very concerned about ice. We're possibly looking, gonna be looking at the issuance of an ice storm warning across multiple states in this area uh, going through later on this week. Now that second system pulls through the Ohio River Valley, moves into New England where it potentially puts down quite a bit of heavy snow, and an Arctic high comes in behind this delivering yet another round of colder air. And you can see the position of that Arctic high basically sitting right on top of Kansas City. Now after that, going into the weekend, there is another push right here. It's in both models for more rain. And that could spread over, finally hitting North Carolina, South Carolina, bringing some rainfall into this area. We do see over the weekend too, another coastal low coming down into parts of the Pacific Northwest. But another big Arctic high follows here, which is gonna take much of the uh, temperature pattern to finish this month of February over to the very cold side of things. I'll show you that in just a few moments. But now that you've seen this out about a week, why don't we just step back and look, take a look at some of the totals. Precipitation first. So there it goes round one, add up round two, and we'll go ahead and put round three on this and let this go out all the way till Monday at 6 a.m. So better snows in the four corner states. We're gonna put some, I'll show you the snowfall totals in a moment, but snow here in the Sierra Nevadas and the Cascades, this will all be snow as well, but we could have a region right in through here, which is already under flood watches from the heavy rain we just saw from the last two systems, possibly adding another two to five inches of rain. But notice the region I want this precipitation, which is in through here, is where we're missing out on it. Let's now take a look at the total snowfall from the 12Z European first. So this is from the first system. Okay, this is two to eight inches of snow in through this area, heavier snows in the mountains. You can see here in the Sierra Nevada adding it up as well. And then the second system rolls, rolls through, and this is gonna be a very tricky area for forecasting the snow from Missouri through Ohio. But that system will pull into New England, producing a pretty widespread swath here of two to eight inches of snow in this area. And then we'll just go ahead and stop this out here about a week because I do not have confidence. See this, what's happening over here in Virginia, North Carolina? Have no confidence in that happening. In fact, this is the first run that that's really showed up. So if we leave it here and show you what the GFS says, okay? Here is the European, here's the GFS effect. Let's play the GFS, sorry. There we go, that's the GFS. You can see relatively consistent forecast except for that second system, I guess it'd be my third system, excuse me, coming out here early next week. All right, ice problems. This is the ice accumulation we're expecting. Generally, you can see here less than, you know, 15 hundredths of an inch, possibly a little bit more in pockets here from system number one. But the one I'm very concerned about is right there. So Wednesday, Thursday, that time frame, there is the potential in this area for picking up a substantial amount of ice. 
We've got to be aware of that potential. So if you're watching this and you are in this area, be paying very close attention. Weather.gov, that's the place that's going to issue the ice storm warnings. I'll bring you up to speed again on Thursday on this. I'll also put in my morning reports, but keep an eye out in this area. Okay, let's now move into week two. The models, by the time we get to day 10 and beyond, are dropping another trough into the west. And you can see here that as you play out past, you know, March 7th, 8th, they're trying to move that ridge like we've seen them do so many times over Alaska. If that's the case, much of the front half of week two will be drier for most of the United States. But expect to see better precipitation return once we get out there past March 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, that time frame. That's what we're currently seeing in both long-range models. Now let's finish this up with a quick temperature discussion. We can see that today's temperatures, I mean, just split across the country in a huge way. 90s in southern Texas, negative single digits for high in North Dakota. Well, that cold air advances on Tuesday. Look at how big this warm sector is. That's what's helping destabilize the atmosphere in this area, giving us risk of the severe storms in the lower Mississippi River Valley. But as we go from Tuesday into Wednesday into Thursday, right here is where I'm concerned about that overrunning. See the surface temperatures down below freezing? But there's going to be a lot of warm air aloft that's going to come up here, go right over the top of this. So this is the area. Watch out in that area for the potential for ice Wednesday into Thursday. By Friday, the colder air advances east. About the only last holdout here will be the Carolinas and parts of the Mid-Atlantic, and then they lose out on Saturday into Sunday. So we're going to finish this month of uh, February quite cold because you can see here going out to day 10, that colder air will be exiting east. But the signals are right here. That tells me that that ridge building over Alaska could be truly in the pattern, in which case that will change things up for the United States going forward. Milder to start the month of March and possibly wetter as well, which we talked about. One thing is for sure, and that is even though you got this cold air coming through, it is not related to the stratospheric polar vortex, the stratospheric polar vortex. It's very strong. And it's amazing just to look back and see that this year, if you just kind of follow the line I'm drawing here, this was the behavior of the polar vortex way up here. See that? A year ago, it dipped down and just incredibly weak and then recovered late in the year. So what a different story year on year the polar vortex has been for us. Still very strong at this point. Now, last thing I want to cover, I know there's a lot going on in Europe right now, a lot of geopolitical things, so I would like to just show you a forecast. Much of the next 10 days is going to be very mild. Notice here is the Black Sea, so this is Ukraine and east, very mild compared to normal. Uh, and the precipitation-wise, we're going to be seeing below average precipitation throughout parts of Ukraine and this part of the Russian wheat belt. So I just wanted to finish with a couple of maps kind of showing you something that was going on here over in Europe and Western Russia. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I really appreciate your attention today. We'll talk to you again on Thursday. Thanks.